Thank you, Tony. It's good to be here with everyone this morning, even if it's not really you, but we are online and we are going to worship this morning just as if you were all sitting here in front of us. I want to invite you to join me in our life verse for March, reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 30. Let's read these words together. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Obviously, this is going to be an abbreviated service, but I want to take a moment to thank Jim Bowling for pulling all of this together and to thank Tony and Victor for striving to help, for helping to strive to bring all of this just a little bit more normalcy and bring that back into our lives. I want to also let you know that if there is a particular song or a particular hymn that you would like to sing or have Tony and or Victor uh, play during one of our upcoming worship services, please send me an email either here at the church, stockton.church at comcast.net, or on my personal email, most of you have that already, Pastor Bill and Sue, the number two at verizon.net. We will do our best to honor your request in upcoming worship services. Just a reminder that we're only able to do this service with your support. Please remember to be, continue to be faithful in your giving, especially during these difficult times. There's a lot of need, and we as the church want to be able to assist as many as we possibly can, but we can only do it with your help. Please continue to use the post office box, that address, P.O. Box 4153, Midlothian, Virginia, 23112, to send us your gifts, and we do really do appreciate that. Before the invocation, I want to extinguish one of our Lenten candles. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in your holy word, you promise us this. You promise, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with, your right, with my righteous right hand. In these troubling times, we stand on your promises, O God, and we lean into your everlasting arms. We gather today seeking refuge from the storms of life. We give thanks and praise to you for your mercy and your grace. Hear our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you received an email from me that has the words to the hymns that we're going to be singing today. I want you to grab a hold of them and let's join and sing together.
give you a couple of updates on our prayer list as we come to this time of united prayer. I want to let you know that Ruby is doing very well with her recovery, and Herbert is moving forward slowly, but he is moving forward, so we are very thankful for that. Pastor Doug got a good report on his scan last week. He seems to be improving also. I have not heard yet from Patty. Frank went back to the doctor on Friday uh, for a report. I haven't heard from them yet, but please keep in touch with all of them and with all of the folks who are on our current prayer list. Again, I believe you received an email from me this week uh, with the names of those who are on our continuous prayer list. Please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Katie's surgery has been postponed until June 7th, and I have not Bill Keene has not heard yet as far as a date for his surgery, uh, which is scheduled to come up in May. Not sure if that's going to happen or not. So just continue to pray for those folks who are um, recuperating and those who are preparing for upcoming surgeries. As always, I invite you now to take a moment in silence and open your heart to your Heavenly Father, because he is waiting to hear from you. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. With grateful and contrite hearts, we bow before you today, Father God. In the midst of our confusion and doubt, you bring us reassurance and comfort. You are our safe harbor in the tumult and an anchor for our soul. You lift us above the raging storm and promise to never leave our side. Our side. Your word reminds us that nothing absolutely nothing can ever separate us from your love. Your son sacrificed his own life for each one of us. There is no greater love than this. And for all of these things, we give you thanks and praise. It's so easy to feel safe and secure when we are gathered together as brothers and, Christ and sisters in Christ. It's so easy to feel good and comforted when we are surrounded by these people when we are here in your house. But when we walk out the door into the world, when we come down from the mountaintop and move into the valley, we often do not experience the same sense of courage. Our spirits long to stay close to your side, enfolded in your strong arms as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But we also know that the real work lies before us as followers of Jesus Christ. We know that that real work is not in here, but out there. Father, we know that the mission field awaits us. We know that the people are hungry to hear your message. Give us the desire and the boldness to go and share the good news so that our faith may be stronger than the fears of the world. We pray for all your people everywhere, Father God, who are facing uncertain days. We ask that you will comfort those who have experienced a loss, that you'll provide healing for those who are facing, facing health issues, and restoration for those whose faith has begun to wane. We pray for those in our church family who are seeking wholeness of health, lifting them to you with our lips and in our hearts. We look forward with great anticipation, O oh Lord, to the day when all of us will be able to gather here once again in our sanctuary at Stockton, healed, healthy, and thankful. And now we plead, come Holy Spirit, and release us from the chains of evil, fear, sickness, and sin. Free us to be the people you created each one of us to be. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, praying as he taught us by uniting our voices as one, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn is hymn number 323, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy.
Amen. Thank you. I know I say it every week, but that's definitely one of my favorites. I want to begin this morning by asking y'all a question. What are you doing during this time of social distancing, during this time of quarantining? I'm not even sure if I spelt that correctly. How has your life been changed by all that's been happening in the world around us? How has your life been changed by this unexpected and sudden upheaval? I'm quite sure that none of you who are with us today can say that there are not differences in how you're living your life today than even from just a couple of weeks ago. We've all been affected in some way by the changes that we're experiencing. And in many cases, we're struggling to adapt to what I refer to now as the new normal. The very first thing I want to tell you this morning, and the very first thing I want you to understand is that you are not alone in your feelings. You are not alone in this situation. We may be isolated from one another, but every man, woman, and child is or will be making some serious changes in their daily routines. And we will all come to the realization that like in the days following 9-11 and those attacks on our nation, as a result of this viral outbreak, our lives are and will be forever changed. So let me ask you again, what are you doing with this time that you have? I wanna make a suggestion to you this morning. I wanna make a suggestion that maybe you try something new. Maybe you try to create something new. I wanna invite you to follow a simple recipe, recipe that I'm gonna give you in just a few minutes. And I want you to become the bold Christian that God created you to be. But I wanna get started first by sharing with you some examples of boldness that we find in the Bible. So I want you to grab your Bibles and, and maybe grab a, a fresh cup of coffee, excuse me. And let's start, well, let's start in the beginning. What better place to start than that? When we look in the book of Genesis, if we look at chapter four, I wanna invite you to read verses one through four. It's the story of Abel and his brother Cain. Specifically, it's the story of how Abel sacrificed to God the firstborn of his flock, not knowing if there would be any more, not knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God would or would not look with favor upon him. That was a bold move that Abel did, and God rewarded him. Go a couple more pages into Genesis in chapter 6 and read about halfway through chapter six, starting at verse six and reading all the way through to the middle of, verse, uh, middle of chapter seven. There's a story there about a man by the name of, Mo of Noah. Now these two events between Abel and Noah are separated by many, many generations. But once again in Noah, in his obedience to God, we see a boldness. We see a boldness that is almost unbelievable in our world today. Now move forward about a thousand years to 1400 BC. We all know the story of Moses. We all know that Moses started out as an abandoned child, that he was raised in the Pharaoh's house by the Pharaoh's daughter. But we also know that within his heart there was a sense that he didn't belong there. If you move into chapter three of the book of Exodus, we read that God called upon Moses to stand up to Pharaoh. He called upon Moses to have a courage that Moses did not know existed within him. He called upon Moses to be bold and to approach Pharaoh and to stand up to Pharaoh an act that would probably and possibly and potentially be fatal. I want to give you a chance to write down a couple of other Old Testament passages that I want you to study later on this week, because I don't have time to go through all of, the, uh, all of the situations in the Old Testament, 
that have to do with boldness. But there's a couple that stand out, and I'd like for you to pay attention to these in the upcoming days. I want you to start off by reading the entire book of Joshua. Focus specifically on the first chapter, especially the first six verses. You'll see a boldness in a man that is unseen today. While you're in the book of Joshua, go ahead and look in chapter 2 at the story of Rahab. This was a very brave and bold woman. The entire book of Ruth, just read through the entire book of Ruth, and we see uh, God's influence in the lives of these women. In the first cha in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we read the story of King David. Actually, at the time, he was little David, the smallest and youngest of all of the brothers. And yet what he does in chapter 17, by standing up to the giant Goliath, was an act of boldness that is just about unequaled. In the New Testament, there are also many stories of boldness. Just to give you a few, read of the boldness of the disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, and really the entire 10th chapter of Matthew. Read of Mary's boldness, young, pregnant, fearful, but read of her boldness in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And there's one more story I want you to look at in the Gospel according to John, chapter 6, verses 6 through 13. There's a, a young boy who has a boldness to share what he was given for his lunch so that thousands could eat. What I want to focus on today, as I talked about, is this recipe, if you will, for boldness. We find it in the book of Acts, chapter 4. The story actually begins in chapter 3, so please listen or read along as I read this to you from Acts chapter 3, the first 10 verses. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, about 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple courts. When the man saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped the man up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now let's pick up the story at the beginning of chapter 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message that Peter and John were speaking, believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas was the high priest, he was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. 
It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they realized that these were unschooled, ordinary men. And they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And God added his blessing to the reading of his holy word. The dictionary defines boldness as a willingness to take risks and act innovatively. In each of these above passages and hundreds of others throughout the Bible, the common denominator of the act of boldness is that it's being performed by ordinary people, people just like you and I. In fact, in some cases, these people in the Bible have even less than we do, and yet they were able to accomplish great things. Consider for a moment, if you will, Peter. As all of you know, I have a personal affection for Peter because in so many ways he reminds me of myself. His heart is usually engaged long before his brain. He was spontaneous, he was impulsive, and he would often leap without looking. Just weeks before he stood boldly in front of this group of rulers, elders, and teachers of the law, he, out of a fear for his own life, denied his Lord three times. At a critical moment when Jesus needed Peter the most to be his boldest, Peter failed, and he failed miserably. How many times have I failed, my Lord? How many times have you? Look at what Peter said. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified. He pointed directly at the teachers and the elders and the rulers. And it says right there in the next verse that because of Peter's boldness, the leaders and the teachers were astonished. When was the last time you astonished anyone, even yourself, with a bold stance against injustice? Let me give you this recipe for boldness. It has four basic steps or ingredients, if you will. And quite honestly, while we're all stuck at home, this may be the best time to put all of this together and build a bolder Christian. I absolutely believe, and I hope you do too, that God puts each of us in particular situations at specific times for his purpose. Do you think for one minute that God is not in control of our current situation? Do you think for one second that God doesn't have his hand on the pulse of our world? I want you to consider this. Even with the best of intentions, you cannot pre prevent yourself 100% from this virus. Neither can your family or your friends or your neighbors give you that safety. The doctors and the scientists are scrambling for answers, and our leaders surely can't save us. Only Jesus can save us. If nothing else positive, if nothing else at all positive comes out of this, the world needs to know that our only hope is to put our faith in God. We must do that. We cannot continue to look to mankind for answers. We must look to God not just during these difficult times, but even after this COVID-19 is just a bad memory. We must continue to turn to the one who cares about us, the one who loves us more than anyone else. After all, as I've said before, what else do you have to do right now? How are you going to use this downtime that God has given you? Are you gonna hide under the covers? Are you gonna binge watch on Netflix? Or are you going to try out this recipe? Step one, make yourself available to God. Remember in the text it said in verse 13, when the leaders and the teachers saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, that they were ordinary men, 
I've told you so many times before, I spent so much of my life before I committed myself to the Lord, hiding in the shadows, insecure, low self-esteem. I was a very ordinary face in the crowd kind of person. And I was okay with that. And now here I am on one of the biggest platforms in the world, bearing my soul and claiming for all to hear who I am today is because I have Jesus Christ in my life. If God can change me, he can change you. But you have to let him use you. Step number two, spend time with Jesus. We've talked before about how when you first started dating that special person in your life, every waking moment you thought about them or you wanted them to be near you. How about ratcheting up your time with God? How about ratcheting up your time talking to and listening to your very best friend, Jesus Christ? Get into the Bible. Use this time to get into the Bible. There are all sorts of things going on in your life and in the world around you right now that either scare you or mystify you. There are things that you want to know more about. All of the answers are right here in God's Word. They've been there all along. All we need to do is put a little effort into finding them. And let me give you a hint. This is a pastor's secret, so you can't tell anybody where you heard it. With computers today, all you need to do is go, Hey Google, where in the Bible does it talk about fill in the blank? You'll find hundreds, if not thousands, of examples and stories of ordinary people who experience the same doubts, the same troubles, the same trials, and the same questions that are facing you now. Step number three. By spending more time in the Word, by spending more time with Jesus, the natural progression is this. Your faith will grow. Each time you read about one of the heroes of faith in the Bible, you will see that they were no different than you are now. They had their struggles. They had their fears. They failed a lot, just like we do. But as they grew in their faith, as you grow in your faith, it will increase exponentially. And when that happens, when your faith grows, when you get closer to God and hear him better and follow him more, you will become more like Jesus. And isn't that really what we want to do? Step four, take risks. Remember earlier I said that the definition of boldness is a willingness to take risks, to act innovatively. The Apostle Paul wrote, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Courtesy of a good friend and colleague of mine, I want to encourage you right now to be bold. Those of you who are watching this on your computer, there should be some place on your screen, maybe down near the bottom, where there's the word share. You want to be bold? You want to do something bold? Hit that button. Share this message. Because as I said, beloved, it's not just Christians that need Jesus right now. It's our whole world that needs him. Our world needs not only to defeat this virus, but we need to turn back to God. Well, maybe you're not ready to be that bold yet. Maybe you're not ready to stand up to the world and say, this is who I am. It's okay. Maybe you just need to spend some more time with God's word first or, or talking with Jesus. I understand. Believe me, I do. The thought of where this is going right now is a little unnerving to me. But it won't happen overnight. Change usually doesn't happen overnight. But it won't happen at all unless you give it a chance. Here's some ways you can show boldness in maybe a simpler way during these uncertain times. As you're preparing dinner for your family tonight or for yourself, how about making an extra plate for that, that lady who lives up the street? You know, the, the one who lives by herself, who's all alone. How about cutting the grass for the elderly man next door who's unable to depend on his family because 
They've been quarantined. How about the person who sits next to you in church? They're out of toilet paper. Can they have a roll of yours? In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, the Lord made this promise. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. My friends, in a few weeks, all of this mess that we have gotten ourselves into is going to clear up. And as history has shown us, much of mankind will go right back to their wasteful, selfish ways. God has given us this opportunity to make a lasting, maybe even an eternal difference in our lives and in the lives of others. Will you respond? Will you be bold for Christ? Will you be the difference in even one other person's life. After all, what else do you have to do with your life right now? Amen. Victor, our closing hymn is... 320, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. 320, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. These are difficult times, my friends. But as I said earlier, we are all in this together. None of us is ever alone. 
because we have our God and our Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And now I want to invite you to go out into the world carefully, safely, wisely, and be bold in your witness for Christ. Because as I said, this is a time when the world needs Jesus more than ever before. Let us, we are all in this together. Let us go as children of the one true God, this day and forevermore. Amen.